in this nail. Today is September 22nd, 2020, and we're going to go over everything we need for class for today. So today is the 22nd. If you come down to the folder where you found this, we are going to compare and contrast the biotic and abiotic features of the intertidal zone. So today you need to complete the no notes for the PowerPoint presentation, watch the magic school bus goes to Muscle Beach, and answer and turn in the questions based off the movie. So I tried to make today a pretty easy, fun day. So once you enter, you'll see the notes. And that's the first thing I'm going to go through with you. That's the document. We don't want that. Here is the PowerPoint. Let's see if I can get me in front while you watch this PowerPoint. The answer is no. Okay. So the intertidal zones. Um, the intertidal zone is the area that's exposed to the air at low tide and it's underwater at high tide. So if you've ever been to the beach, the intertidal zone is where you've played. It's where the beach is and it's where that water fluctuates on a daily basis. It includes lots of different habitats. It has steep rocky cliffs, sandy beaches, it can be wetlands, it can be a swamp, it can be a marsh. It's anywhere where there's a tide. So it occurs worldwide. Um, sometimes it's a really narrow strip. It's only a few meters wide or three feet wide. Sometimes it can go on for meters and meters and miles and miles. Your intertidal zone sometimes can be four or five miles. Um, the physical characteristics is that it's found anywhere there's a shoreline. So these are your abiotic factors of an intertidal zone, I guess. Um, water is available regularly. So all of the creatures that live in this area have access to water. Um, some of that water can be fresh water. Some of that water might be salt water, and that might affect the, area, the organisms that live there. But there will always be water availability. And one of the other physical characteristics temperature-wise is it's extremely varying. Um, during the middle of the day, it can be extremely hot in the intertidal zone. Uh, temperatures can skyrocket, especially if there's no water to help normalize that temperature. Remember, water is resistant to temperature change, so the organisms that are covered in water are going to be resistant to that fluctuation in temperature. But when they're exposed, that temperature that they're exposed to can sometimes raise 20 to 30 degrees. So depending on where they are in the zone, they have to be able to withstand severe temperature fluctuations. Animals in this zone. Um, most of the organisms in this zone are simple and small. And they have to be able to be adapted to an environment, sorry, the light's funky on the camera, be adapted to an environment of harsh extremes. So the supply of water is intermittent during high tide. It's, the whole area is covered. During low tide, most of the zones are exposed. Uh, the animals have to have a way to prevent desiccation or drying out. That's why if you look at oysters, oysters have that nice shell that closes really, really tight. It keeps everything on the inside moist, and wet until the tide comes back and they can open back up when there's water. Uh, wave action around the shore can wash away or dislodge organisms, so they have to have some way to attach to where they are. If they can't attach when the waves come in and out, it'll pick them up and wash them away. High exposure to the sun and temperature range can be extreme. Um, same thing as an abiotic factor, but the animals have to be able to withstand that 20 degree difference in temperature sometimes. And sometimes they're not covered with water, so they're exposed to the harmful rays of the sun, those UVA, UVB rays. And the salinity. The salinity is a lot higher in the intertidal zone because water trapped in those rock tide pools starts to evaporate. Remember, the only way to change salinity is to add or take away water. So if the water gets trapped in a tide pool, and then we slowly evaporate the water. That salinity in the tide pool keeps increasing until the water comes back in the next day. So they have to be able to withstand extreme amounts of salt. Here's a picture of our intertidal zone. So we've got our subtidal zone, or our areas that are always submerged, even on low tide. All of these animals still have water. We have the intertidal. We have the high tide zone, or the supertidal. And then we have upland or splash zone. The rocky intertidal zone, this is a tidal zone like you can see in the picture, that's made up of rocks or a substrate beside sand or beside something that's soft. It occurs on steep coasts without large amounts of sediment. Again, think big rocks. It's recently uplifted. There's not much time to erode. If there's not much time to erode, then there's not much time to make those little bitty minerals of salt. The rocks are still very large. Uh, the west coast of America, California, is 
Portland, Oregon, Washington, these are great places where the beaches are this rocky inner tidal zone. Hawaii is the same way. Those are new beaches. That's new land over there. So the zones haven't had time to break down and form the nice sandy beaches that we have in the Gulf of Mexico or on the east coast of the U.S. So there's three zones inside the rocky intertidal zone. There's the low intertidal zone, the mid intertidal zone, and the high intertidal zone. And let's go through each one. So the high tide zone or the upper mid littoral zone is flooded only during high tide. So when it's not high tide, there's no water there. So this gets wet twice a day if we're in a semi-diurnal, once a day if we're in a diurnal tidal pattern. Um, it's highly saline. The abundancy of water isn't enough to sustain lots of vegetation, but some animals and plants can survive here. Um, some great examples are anemones. This is a glass sea anemone. We have a barnacle, a brittle star, which is like a starfish, a chitin, a crab. I'm sorry, I'm trying to see what I have here listed. Um, I don't have any green algae. I don't have isopods. This is a limpet. This is a whelk. And these guys over here are mussels. The mid-tidal zone is submerged for equal amounts of the day. So it's submerged half the day and it's exposed to air half the day. The wave action here is the greatest. This is where the water line is 90% of the day. So this is where they're going to get the most wave action. It's got a high population. It's got a lot of seaweed in this area. So organisms here are able to be a little bit more complex. They're often larger in size than those found in high tide and splash zones. They include um, anemones. Oop, that's not an enemy. An enemy is over here. Barnacles, chitons, crabs, green algae, isopods, limpets, mussels, sea lettuce, sea palm, sea star snails, sponges, and whelks. So over here we've got a sponge. We've got a blue crab here. Um, here is a different kind of sea star. So it's not a brittle star. This isn't a sea star. Um, down here we have got that is a crustacean of some sort. A snail. We've got green algae and sea lettuce. The low tide zone is submerged 90% of the time. It's teeming with life and it has much more marine vegetation because they have the protection of the water all the time. They don't have to have any way to brace themselves or protect themselves if the water goes away. Um, organisms in this zone, we have got a sea slug. We've got fish in this zone. We have got clams. This is an urchin. We've got um, lots of different seaweeds. We've got corals in this area because they're able to actually rock down and attach down to the earth. Tide pool is the last thing we're going to talk about, and each tide pool is unique. So it depends on where the tide pool forms as to what's going to be in it. But a tide pool is when there's a depression. When the tide recedes, the water stays in that depression. Um, they face large sudden changes in salinity and temperature and pH, and they differ from each other depending on the depth and height of the intertidal zone. Some intertidal zones are big enough to actually house things like octopus. Some you're only going to find tiny creatures like barnacles in. The sandy intertidal zone is different from the rocky intertidal zone because it has a sand bottom. Um, the Gulf Coast is one, the Gulf of Mexico, the east coast of the United States of America is another sandy intertidal zone. So when you think about going to the beach here, that's going to be a sandy intertidal zone. Um, it can be a sand bottom, it can be a silt bottom, it can be a clay bottom, it can be a mud bottom. Um, if you've ever been to the river, that's usually a clay bottom. And they don't have obvious zonation. So in a rocky zone, we can say that there's a definite high tide zone, intertidal zone, low tide zone, or subtidal zone. Here, there's very little zonation. A lot of the animals that live in your mid tide or your intertidal zone, your high tide zones, are going to live underneath the substrate, or they're going to bury themselves in the sand. Up here, in all the zones, we have what's called a spray zone. So spray zone doesn't ever get any water, but it's affected daily by the splashing of the water. So when the water splashes up on the shore, the spray zone is where the water splashes. If you've ever been to SeaWorld, Six Flags, anything like that, and it says during this show, please don't sit in this, or please only sit in the splash zone if you want to get wet. Same thing. 
So humans are highly dependent on our all of the intertidal habitats. We depend on them for food. We depend on them for raw materials. 50% um, of the humans on Earth live within 100 kilometers of the coast. So almost every human or half the humans on Earth have some kind of impact on our intertidal zones. They're greatly influenced by human impacts, both to ocean and land habitats. Here's some pictures of just some different things. Um, we've got some shrimp up here. Um, I know I enjoy eating shrimp and mollusks, oysters, things like that, as long as they're not raw, please cook them. But that's a one way we affect the intertidal zone. We've got people over here participating in a beach cleanup. Here's people just hanging out at the beach. Let's hope they don't leave their trash behind because that's going to affect all the animals that live there. Here's a house that's built directly on the beach. And last but not least um, is a sign for a coastal cleanup. So the main things, the main current topics we're dealing with, the three things you're going to write at the bottom of the sheet. The first one is climate change. Um, as temperatures increase, the temperature of the water will slowly increase. It can only resist temperature change for so long. Sea level continues to rise, so what was once the low tide zone is starting to turn into the actual edge of the continental shelf. And we have an increased storminess, which would increase our wave action. All of that's going to have a major impact on the intertidal zone. The species can adapt, but can they adapt quick enough to beat out extinction? We don't know. Invasive species is another problem in the intertidal zone. It's especially prevalent in areas with high volumes of shipping traffic. Um, we're trying to eradicate some species in their non-native habitats and prevent other species introductions. Um, so basically what's happening is ships take water up in their ballast as they move throughout the world and they don't always, you're not supposed to empty your ballast water in shipping channels. A lot of times they will empty their ballast water in shipping channels. Because of that, a species that's not native to the area is introduced and it throws the entire food web off. Sometimes it can completely obliterate the food web. Over here we have Spartina, which is a type of cord grass. It's native to the east coast of the United States. It's been brought over to California where it's not native. It's completely taken over a lot of those rocks beaches and rocky shores and it's eliminated all of the natural vegetation found there which wouldn't be a problem but the animals that live over there won't eat Spartina so they're slowly starving to death. We have got a crab that was introduced. Down here we have a whelk. These guys actually drill a hole in the oysters or the animals. They suck the insides out and the oyster or the mussel or whatever it is dies. They're extremely invasive and they have no known predators. Down here we have zebra mussels. They were introduced from the Baltic Sea into the Great Lakes. It's a massive problem in the Great Lakes. In fact, before you can put a boat in the water at the Great Lakes, they will check your entire boat for any sign of zebra mussels. Last but not least, this is a green algae. Finally, we have marine protected areas. So our intertidal zones are exploited for things like food gathering, clam digging, snails, mussels, algal collecting, oystering. Um, these little boys up here are digging for clams. Down here, these are both methods for oystering. Um, so human traffic has greatly affected the, the abiotic factors in their area, which then affects the animal's life, especially overfishing, overharvesting, those kinds of things can eliminate the population. So the third thing we're trying to do is establish marine protected areas where people can't fish or they have limits on how much they fish in all that good stuff, to try to bring back the species and not hurt the species. All right, after you take your notes, the next thing is to watch the Magic School Bus. Um, if you go here, there is a link to the Magic School Bus. It'll bring you up. It's like a school videos, I think is the name of the website. School Tube. It'll bring you to the Magic School Bus episode. If you have Netflix, um, if you have a subscription to Netflix, you can go to Netflix. It's available at a much higher quality. Um, it's going to be season four, episode two on Netflix, The Magic School Bus Goes to Muscle Beach. And it will explain about all the different zones. Last but not least, make sure you open the Intertidal Zone Movie Guide Worksheet. And answer the questions. I don't want you to get the answers out of your notes, and I don't want you to get the answers off the internet. Make sure you get the answers from the movie. So if it's not how it's worded in the movie, that's not the answer I want. Um, and I will count off because it would really be easy to Google a lot of these answers, but I want you to actually watch the video, 
while you're watching the movie, make sure you're not just paying attention to what's going on. Make sure you're watching what's going on in the background, what's around the muscles. Um, and one scene is going to talk about starfish, and other scenes it's going to talk about kelp. Look around the muscles. Look at the areas around them. I want you to really get a sense for what the intertidal zone is like for life that lives there. Once you're done with all that, you are done for the day, and I will see you tomorrow. You don't have to turn in your notes today, but please make sure you do that movie guide, movie worksheet by midnight tonight. Bye, guys.